Welcome back, everyone, to the Crowd Money Cast. My name is Clay Graubard, and every month, me and my co-host Andrew Eady sit down to discuss real money prediction markets and interview key players in the space. In this month's episode, Andrew and I first discuss the growing number of prediction markets, the increasing market fragmentation, and our thoughts and forecasts for consolidation over the next half decade. After that, we interview Jason Trost, the founder and CEO of Smarkets, a London-based betting platform primarily focused on sports, but increasingly expanding into political and economic markets featured on more traditional prediction markets like Predictit, Callshe, Polymarket, and others. In our interview with Jason, we discuss the origins of the platform, how Jason seeks to differentiate Smarkets from its sports betting and prediction market counterparts, and how he views the present and future of the space. Following our interview, Andrew and I reflect upon Jason's final claim that prediction markets is actually a suboptimal term and briefly brainstorm how we might find a solution. Before we get started, if you're interested in reading more about real money prediction markets or are new to the space and want to learn more, head over to crowdmoney.io to catch up on our newsletters and previous podcasts. You can subscribe for free to receive the October 26 newsletter directly in your inbox as well as stay updated when subsequent Crowd Money casts release at crowdmoney.io. Without further ado, and I apologize for my cold and any difficulty you might have in understanding what I have to say, Andrew, with your healthy and clean voice, why don't you get us started for episode two? So today we have a really interesting conversation in store for you all with the CEO of Smarkit, uh, Jason Trost. Um, and one thing that that interview got me thinking about was just the number of prediction markets out there. And I think, you know, when we think about any uh, new technology or innovation, whether it's cryptocurrencies and all the ICOs that happened or the NFT boom, you see this initial sort of rapid expansion of projects. Um, and that's often followed by then a shrinking and a consolidation in the market. Uh, we saw this with the dot-com boom as well, where there was you know, thousands and thousands of websites that people thought had intrinsic value because they were just URLs and, you know, people weren't really sure about the value prop of, of the high-speed internet at that point. Um, and then eventually we saw, you know, a lot of those domains go down or become consolidated as, um, you know, real values added into the space. So I think, you know, thinking about prediction markets, there have been a lot, you know, going back to 2012, 2013, even earlier, some markets we know was, you know, 07, 08. Um, you know, between uh, Smarkets, Callshe, Augur, Polymarket, Predictit, you know, there's so many, and a lot, Hedgehog Markets, a lot of new markets cropping up. Um, it's going to be interesting to see, one, how the number of markets affects, uh, you know, volume and liquidity for each individual market, and then also, you know, what's going to happen in the next five or 10 years, and um, will we see consolidation? I think also one big question is, what does consolidation look like in the prediction market space? Um, with URLs or with businesses, you know, integration seems where there's, it's a bit easier to sort of conceptualize for prediction markets, you know, each of these markets have very different value propositions, you know, different ways of generating liquidity, um, different goals even for their markets and different topics that they're focusing on. So the idea of seeing them integrate is interesting, but I can also see it, you know, posing some concerns. And so Granted that I'm working off the premise that I don't think um, this level of fragmentation is sustainable if prediction markets are going to become mainstream. It's going to be interesting to see, you know, what that consolidation looks like if it's just some markets going away or if we see some MA activity. Yeah, I, I think Jason raised a really interesting point, and you touched this on as well, is that like when you're dealing with stocks, no matter where you buy your stock, if you buy it on Robinhood, E-Trade or whatever, your share of IBM or Ford is the same no matter where you are. And even on crypto where you have, you know, all these very different exchange, if you're still buying BTC USD, it's roughly the same thing no matter where you go. And so there's only like one kind of contract. But when it comes to these prediction markets, you know, even if they're talking about the same thing, it's on two very different platforms. And so uh, I think the big thing with um, having this fragmentation is that it hurts liquidity because you know you have people trading on roughly similar things but across different platforms and you know that doesn't help out any of the liquidity that you have uh in in a single market and it it does seem like 
you know, down the line that there can't be this many uh, different exchanges, right? There, I mean, in the stock market, there are there are multiple exchanges out there, but there has been a lot of consolidation and a lot more consolidation than we see in the prediction market space. Um, do you have a sense in terms of like time horizon, like? Will this be? Will the number of markets continue to further expand before it begins to shrink and consolidate? I think that's going to be very much dictated by sort of very basic supply and demand uh, dynamics. I think you know right now there's a very large supply, um, and that can only be sustained if demand matches it. If the demand that I think a lot of these markets are expecting to come about doesn't, um, then I don't think. Uh, you know, this level of fragmentation is going to last for very long. I would say, I mean, based on, so we noticed when Kalshi came into the market, a lot of things changed. We saw Poly Market, for example, start to invest a lot more in their PR and marketing efforts, and they became a lot more visible on social. Um, I think the same for Predicted, you know, we've talked to them and they seem very active and engaged on the marketing front. And a lot um, of other projects have sort of like gone public and gone out, gone out of stealth mode that probably yeah, might have stayed in and, longer, right? If it wasn't for yeah, Kalshi. they thought, yeah. So you know, based on how quickly all that has moved, my inclination is, you know, I think things will happen quickly. I think in the next um, three to five years, uh, we'll probably see um, sort of the zenith of this fragmentation, and after that, I think we'll start to see the you know subsequent consolidation, um, and whether that's you know some projects like Forecast, for example, from Facebook, which just sunset. Um, last month, you know, I think we might see some of those instances. I think we might see, um, you know, some uh, m and activity that's more focused on, um, you know, hiring the people and getting the technology and less about actually merging the markets. Um, and so that's sort of another form of sunsetting that uh, is more creative, I think, in, in the long run. So, um, yeah, I'd say three to five years, we'll see you know, the end of the fragmentation. And then after that, um, we'll start to see uh, consolidation on the PM front and also from a lot of their backers who might want to mm. um, sort of consolidate as well. It's a very popular investment strategy. How do you see that consolidation playing out um, in similar and also dissimilar ways when it comes to the crypto prediction markets? And maybe that's not the best term, which we'll talk about with Jason here in a little bit. Um the crypto prediction markets versus the real money markets that exist. Do you see sort of different dynamics playing out or do you think it'll be roughly similar stories um, across these two domains? I mean, I think there, I'm not sure if there's an example of this right now, but you know, a market could come up um, that's a combination of some of the markets we see today that offers, you know, a USD betting option and also a crypto betting option. And then it becomes just a more sort of full service, full suite, uh, prediction market offering. So I think that's got potential. Um, but I think then also there's, as we know, and as we've heard from a lot of uh, people we've interviewed, a lot of legal hurdles um, in the prediction market space that might preclude a, you know, a call sheet or something from doing something like that. Um, so it's going to be tricky. I think um, the consolidation is going to happen more like uh, sort of my latter point where um, you know, you might see one of the bigger prediction markets with more funding, uh, you know, hire some of the uh, really good talent from other prediction markets and maybe take some of those ideas and, you know, fold them in, but ultimately sunset um, the latter project. I think that seems like a more, um, more e easily sellable um, and also this low, low lift uh, endeavor for the buyer in a lot of cases. So that's my forecast or my prediction but we'll see the speaking of making forecasts and this is something that we had discussed recently uh when i visited you in new york is sort of like and i think we should talk about this maybe in in the next crowd money newsletter which you can get at crowdmoney.io um but where do you see the most growth potential do you think it'll be in the crypto related prediction markets or will it be in the real money when we're thinking about over these next three to five years just like quick thoughts and we can talk more about this later. Um, I'd say short term, I think I see more growth potential in real money prediction markets just because of sort of adoption and friction to use 
Um, but in the long term, as you know, I'm very bullish on, on NFTs, on crypto, and I think that will become a mainstay of um, the way that economics works in this country and around the world. And so I think, you know, sort of long term, there's a lot of potential in, um, in a lot of the uh, prediction markets operating on, on the blockchain or on various blockchains and side chains, you know, which blockchain or side chain uh, is going to be, you know, the front runner in, in five or 10 years. I think that's tough to say. Um, you know, we've seen now prediction markets on Solana and on Ethereum and on Polygon side chain. And so, um, you know, I think there's still a lot of questions there, but I think generally speaking, um, you know, long-term there's probably more growth potential in the crypto space. Um, and I guess one other thought I have is that, you know, we we're talking about fragmentation and how it's not sustainable, but I think it's also really important at this stage for prediction markets. Um, it's a good sign. You know, it's a pretty bullish sign, right? Yeah. And when you think about, you know, we were talking about how a lot of the markets that exist on, say, a poly market might also exist on a call sheet or somewhere else. What that does is it does sort of dilute volume, but it also, I think, increases demand because, you know, they're substitute goods. And so um, I think you're just getting these sorts of markets um, in front of more eyes and you're just growing demand for these sorts of markets so that when the consolidation does come, you're going to have sort of a critical mass of, of users and um, I think a lot of really good uh, mainstream adoption. So I think it's it's important and sort of a natural part of this um, growth trajectory that prediction markets are on. Um, but yeah, I don't think it's going to be long lived just because, you know, for any of these prediction markets to survive and thrive at the level that they want to, um, you know, this level of fragmentation is going to have to change a little bit. Yeah, I think I would agree with a, a lot of what you have to say, and I think it'll be interesting to explore this in a crowd money issue. I think the point about real money growing in the short term, I think, makes a lot of sense because the people that we see interested in working in this space tend to have a finance background. Um, and one of those people is Jason Trost, who we will be speaking with, uh, and he is the founder and CEO of Smarkets. So let's get to that interview right now. Jason Trost, welcome to the Crowd Money Cast. It's great to have you with us. Thanks for having me, guys. So we want to start off talking about Smarkets, its origin, and sort of where you see yourself and your company within the larger prediction market ecosystem. Uh, so Smarkets has been around since 2007, 2008, uh, starting in sports betting and also uh, politics. And sort of since you've been around, there's been sort of uh, a major push into the prediction market space, particularly in recent years. Uh, you have Kalshi, the first CFTC regulated market, which launched in beta this year poly market in 2018, and you have a whole slew of crypto markets that have been popping up in recent years and are coming online today. Um, and it seems like right now, Smarkets is making a, a larger push away from what seemed to be a previous focus, more so on the sports betting, to going into politics, economics, and other sort of future event contracts. Um, what was the original vision and mission of Smarkets? Did you always sort of see, you know, the push into these um, alternative markets becoming like a, a major focus of the platform? Or is that something that sort of developed over time? And if so, like, what was the impetus behind that? Yeah, no, I would say I kind of started as a prediction market geek, um, if you could call it that. So um, I was and still am a political junkie, follow politics way too closely, read way too many articles. And back in 2003, it was Bush's, uh, Bush was up for re-election. And I came across this website. It was called Trade Sports at the time. And they had a presidential market that would let somebody trade the outcome of the election, Bush versus Kerry. And, you know, at the time I was obsessed with, um, with the election and uh, I was reading so many articles about it. And then when I came across this website, Trade Sports, I was like, holy crap, you can have a market that trades 24 hours a day on this. Um, you guys are probably way too young for this, but I remember this one moment during the Republican National Convention, John Kerry went windsurfing, and this is back when windsurfing was sort of considered scandalous, which is kind of a funny sign of the times, but windsurfing was seen to be elitist and out of touch with the common man, and George Bush was the guy you wanted to have the beer with, and the media kind of made a big deal about it, and it was so interesting to go to the trade sports market and be able to see the dip and market move and all that kind of stuff, and I thought, this is amazing, and at the time, I was a stock trader. I was a professional stock trader that was, tra I traded NASDAQ stack in New York Stock Exchange stocks. And so I was so used to trading. I was so into politics. And I'm like, this is the perfect 
uh, fusion between trading and something I care about. Like the fact that you could trade an event was, it was mind blowing to me. Um, the thing that kind of tickled my entrepreneurial side was that I thought, uh, the interface was completely unintelligible. I had a really hard time understanding how did you buy and sell? What was the, what was the transaction fee? Um, and and uh, when I was a stock trader, I had this pretty advanced interface. And I was on one side, I had my stock trading interface. On the other hand, I had trade sports. And I thought, why don't I have the stock trading interface for trading events. Mm. And, and also I sort of came at it from the point of view of, I can't understand, I study computer science. If a guy who studies computer science, who trades professionally for a living, can't understand this interface, there's gotta be a better way to do it. So the, 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 just to wrap up why I founded SmartKit. So I kind of put that idea in the back burner. And then one of my best friends moved to London and worked in the city. And he came across this company called Betfair Exchange, which basically had uh, an events market on sports. And we noticed the same problem was existing. It was a very confusing interface. Um, and also from a trading perspective, I really drilled into the pricing model and the, the transaction fees are insane on Betfair, insane. You know, at least from a financial context, they're insane. They're cheap sort of from a sports betting context. So that was the original vision was basically event markets are super cool. They're super powerful. You know, this idea that I don't have to read 20 articles to, to guess myself uh, of who's going to win the election. And uh, there's the, the technology already exists in finance. Why don't we just move technology over? So that was the, uh, the benefit. And um, before, we, before we get to the next question, just, just to kind of round that off, I think what's really interesting about prediction markets is that we are all obsessed about prognosticating the future. And, you know, that's why the weather report is so valuable. Like, you know, we are obsessed with knowing if it's going to rain or not at 3 p.m. You know, this, I think it's because, you know, in our daily lives, they're so uncertain. And we kind of really want to cling on to these ideas that we know, we think we know it's going to happen in the future. And if you think about all the ways that you can do the future, you can ask an expert, you can take a poll. And you can uh, you can um, you can forecast it, and and I found in my experience the absolute best thing to do is to put real money on it and uh, tap into the wisdom of crowds to to prognosticate the future. So while there's a crop of new startups that have come up, I think that as a society we have like just barely barely scratched the potential of prediction markets, and it's something I'm super passionate about. And it's uh, one of the goals in uh, in our company. So sorry, that was a little bit of a long answer. <laughs> no, that's great. I'm, I'm one. You know, you talk about wisdom of the crowds and all of that. Um, I, I assume that you follow some like the academic literature, sure, whether that's like Philip Tetlock, Pavel Atanasov, um, a, a lot of other researchers that sort of look at forecasting. I'm wondering, like, how does how has that maybe impacted the way in which you've led the direction of markets over all this time, right? Because super forecasting came out 2015, about, you know, seven, eight years after the launch of the platform. Has that, you know, created any like new ideas for you? Uh, and like, and, yeah. To be honest, not really. I'm not that influenced by the academic art, uh, literature. I'm glad people are doing it because I still think there's a lot of skepticism or I would say under understanding about the potential of prediction markets. So it's nice that people are doing academic research to kind of put a scientific, um, a scientific uh, rigorous approach to proving the validity of, of these approaches. But I've kind of been, I was an early convert as to the power of the prediction market, you know, probably from, you know, all the way back in 2003. So I didn't, I didn't need to be convinced of the power. To me, the hard part is creating the marketplace to make, to make these things happen. Legally, it's very complicated. Technologically, it's very complicated. And then on top of that, you have a marketplace dynamics. And, you know, in a marketplace, you have a chicken and egg issue. So the, I'm, I've mainly been focused on the operational issues of trying to bring people to a marketplace to get them to trade. Now we focus on sports at markets. And the main reason we focus on sports is for the business case. You know, sports is the largest prediction market in the world by a giant, giant margin. And so that's why we do sports, but we do see ourselves as a generic fintech company. Uh, it's just, if you compare the sports market to what people trade in, in politics, it's like, it's night and day. You know, I would say sports is probably I don't know, a million times bigger than the political trading market, 
right now, but I do see a, a, a world where uh, political betting and event trading, non-sports event trading um, should be more and more prominent. So as you touched on just now, you know, one of the biggest uh, sort of challenges or, or obstacles that you faced is, you know, getting people onto the platform. As you talked about earlier, a big factor in getting people onto the platform is the UI and the interface, especially compared to some of these other platforms. Um, you know, Clay and I were very impressed with uh, Smarkit's interface. The fact that, you know, the front page, if you know, for listeners, if you haven't seen, um, it's got dynamic markets that show moving prices and, you know, it shows sort of the, the, the dynamism of these markets, but it's not, you know, in your face and flashy. Um, can you speak a bit about how you arrived at the current iteration of, of the UI for Smarkets and, um, you know, some of the considerations that went into it, especially because you're, you know, in more than just sports? Yeah, so delving into the world of entrepreneurship a little bit, there's kind of a seminal book called The Four Steps of the Epiphany, and it talks about the different models that you can have as a, as a business, whether you're creating a new market, resegmenting a market, um, and there's four different paths. The one we're doing is resegmenting a market. So from a business perspective, our goal is to try to take market share from Betfair. Now, I've always been passionate about bringing financial technology to sports, but event trading and sports betting. Um, the challenge is that we have to make a business case. And the business case was we need to take customers that are at our competitor and move them over to us. So I am proud of our user interface, uh, but I still think we haven't gone far enough. Uh, I don't think we've gone far enough. I think it's a good middle ground, but I want to keep pushing markets to be more akin to a financial exchange and less akin to a sports betting website. So we're still in the middle of that transition. Um, I really have an issue with the betting, the order book, the order book. Mm -hmm. If you are not familiar with betting in the UK, it's a very foreign looking thing. And so I think that's where we really fail on the UI. And, and that's something that, you know, we, we haven't made the call to move it over, but we, we haven't made the call when to move it over, but we will move it over to a more traditional order book. I think what you're seeing on the homepage is the graphs and stuff like that. What we tried to make these markets, if not fully accessible, somewhat accessible to a non-betting audience. And that's why we have the charts. That's why there's percentages next to all the odds so that you can try to see what's, uh, what, um, what, the, what the thing means, you know, because odds, sports betting odds, if you're not into sports betting are completely unintelligible uh, to, to a mainstream audience. Uh, in terms of the user interface, that's one of the main reasons I founded the company. You know, trade sports was a pretty successful, at least in a certain niche in America. But I found it a really bad interface. And I thought, you know, interface is half the problem. It, you know, if you can't get people to understand what you're trying to do, you, you've lost them uh, at the beginning. So our interface has always been uh, a focus for us. And, and I appreciate you you liking some aspects of it. But as the founder... I'm, I'm disappointed that we haven't pushed the envelope further towards uh, the financial side of things. Yeah, I, I was going to say that from like a sports betting perspective, it looks like to be a, a very great UI, but there seems to be some sort of growing pains with that transition to event contracts. And the order book, I think for me, is one of the very complicated things, especially, you know, as it translates from going from like a one-on-one -on -one sports match and you know, other outcomes there versus like who's going to win the French election in um, later next year. Um, you know, outside of like the order book, like where do you see uh, Smarkets uh, and your team sort of changing up uh, the UI to, you know, get to that, you know, next stage? Well, I, I don't think it's about uh, reinventing the wheel. I think it's more just like if you're comfortable trading stocks, you should be comfortable trading on markets. You know, it's that kind of like that basic buy and sell mechanism. The complicated part of the order book, and this is a little bit of a nuance between event trading and uh, stock trading. Like if I trade IBM stock, there's one order book for IBM. You know, there's not, there's like one place to trade that price. All the bids are on one side, all the offers are on one side. But if you trade... The French election, let's say there's 20 major candidates for the French election or whatever, 10 major candidates. Each candidate is an order book. There isn't one order book for the French election unless you, you were able to make the contract into a binary outcome. Like, is it Macron or not? Could be an, one order book. Uh, but short of that, it gets extremely complicated. So if you take like a normal 
uh, soccer game, team A, team B playing against each other. We have around 60 markets, give or take for, for that. And I would say within those 60 markets, two, 300 order books. So it's incredibly, it's, it, you know, it gets very messy, very fast. And, and I think that's one of the main challenges as you try to move towards more of that level two style interface is what I would call it in a, in a financial context, you know, like to have 300 level two order books for a Arsenal versus Chelsea match, you know, you can see it gets complicated very quickly. So going off the topic of order books, um, you know, one of the things that we've seen with some of the other prediction market platforms out there is the way the order books affect market liquidity. Um, you know how, and this might be a bit, you know, different for markets because you're in the sports space and um, there's just so much activity there. But how do you think about sort of like liquidity and um, you know potentially like market makers and automated market makers? Um, as a way to just generate liquidity into, like across the markets. When I founded the company myself, I had, even though I had a trading background, I had zero intention of being in the prop trading risk business. I, you know, I, I was like, I don't know anything about sports. And well, I, I like sports as a guy who watches TV on Saturdays, but you know, I'm not like a sports trading expert and, and I just thought it was too risky and all that kind of stuff. And then while we were building early prototypes, um, you know, all of our markets were empty. And I, and I, you know, I was, even though I have a technical background, I wasn't, I was more on the operations business side of things. So I took my trading experience and just wrote a basic algorithm to put prices up on the screen. And long story short, like, you know, my goal was to always transfer it over to quote unquote professional sports market makers. Um, but we were too small to, for people to spend their time integrating with us. And so we just got better and better out of necessity trading sports. And eventually we started making money. And then eventually we started making a lot of money trading sports. So we've kind of built this by, it's one of those like by accident business models, but we're one of the world's largest sports betters right now. Uh, we trade about $15 million of sports every day, 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. And uh, so we do it ourselves. So we do, we do most of the political liquidity is ourselves. Um, most of the sports liquidity is ourselves. Now, that said, we have an open marketplace and anybody can put up bids and offers and we lose money all the time to our customers. And some of our customers have made seven figures against us. And so... You know, we we don't uh, we don't give ourselves undue advantage trading people. Like we are mainly there. Of course, we want to make money, but we're mainly there to sort of facilitate good market dynamics. Because you know, without any liquidity, it's a very very boring marketplace. But uh, yeah, to answer your question, we largely solved it ourselves, and that's a different tack than I think a lot of prediction markets take. It's a different tack than I would have said. Like back when I was founding the company, I would have said, "No way, no way, mm -hmm. we would do this." But I think I think it's sort of uh, I think it's one of our secret weapons, um, and it's something we're going to keep leaning into as we get bigger and bigger. Because if you go back to the um, the order book problem, you know you don't need somebody to quote IBM. You need somebody for if you want to trade, you know if you mapped an IBM trade to a Arsenal versus Chelsea match, you need you need three to four hundred different order books for that mark you know it's an insane amount of data it's an insane amount of risk it's the same amount and these markets move really fast especially in play so you can imagine mm. like three or four hundred order books every time a goal is scored every time there's a corner kick every time a player uh, goes to the ground the markets are like moving all the time and rather than you know, it's a much, you know, if you take like some of these crypto markets, right? So you have like, let's say you have a Bitcoin USD, uh, that, that's one order book. That's one order book. But with a giant football match, you have uh, three, three or 400 order books. And sometimes there's uh, correlations between them. So like nil, nil and over and under half a goal is obviously correlated, but some don't have correlations. And so to provide liquidity in the event space is incredibly complicated. Politics are even more complicated because they're not repeatable events. So like in this, if you take soccer as an example, you have an 11 V 11, there's a, there's a giant rectangle. You can't use your hands. And if this round thing crosses one of the lines, it's called a goal. You know, the, the game is quite well understood, but in elections, it's like, even elections are not repeatable, you know, like, 
if you take a U.S. style election versus a parliament style election, like, you know, like there's no concept of a hung parliament in an American context. And there's no, you, you know, like even within elections, it becomes crazy ambiguous. So the rules are hard to set up. They're not repeatable events. And uh, it's, so it's, it's also incredibly difficult to provide liquidity for politics. But I think, I mean, it's what we do and, and we're getting better at it, but, it, but liquidity is a very tricky part of the equation. So there's liquidity. And I'm also just thinking when trying to get traders onto platforms and feeling and having it be closer to trading stocks is providing maybe more information to a trader about an event, right? If I'm going to buy shares in IBM and I open up my E-Trade app, it'll tell me what the PE ratio is, what the 52-week low high is. It'll have a lot of information that I can use to at least get a rough understanding of if this is a sound investment. Sure, I'll have to know how to use that information, but it's at least there. Uh, and prediction markets, the only information that you generally have is um, the past performance of that market. So you can see what people were giving the odds for the French presidential election back in May. But there's like that base rate information, which the research says, you know, making good forecasts, one of the base, best things to have is base rate, the historical uh, sort of outcomes of similar events um, is really useful. Like, do you see um, markets and just like prediction markets in general? Like, are there uh, market indicators and market information that should be provided um, in that interface to them? Or is, or is that like something that should be left up to the individual to sort of go out and find on their own? Is that not a responsibility of, of smart markets down the line? No, I definitely think it's, I, I don't know if I'd phrase it as a responsibility. I'd phrase it more as like good design rather than responsibility. But the pro, like we do show on our interface high low. So you can see the range that a contract is trading. So like Macron to get reelected, you'll be able to go and see like the highest price that he's traded at and the lowest price he's traded at. But these, but in terms of like PEO, PEO, PE ratio, that concept does not exist in political betting. And, and the election, the, you know, Macron's second election has nothing to do with his first election. So uh, there isn't a lot of data to be sharing with the user besides sort of base financial stats, which I think we could add a few more of those, but we do, we have some, but I, I there, you know, if you're trading a, an equity, there's a very strong, uh, you know, you mentioned PE ratio, you know, you have market cap, PE ratio, high, low, 52 week, you know, these are very strong, what would they say, KPIs for stocks that people are used to trading, but, you know, there's no equivalent KPI in, in uh, politics, at least not that I know. Um, I'm, like, I'm curious, do you think that, um, you know, obviously, as you said, uh, you know, there, are, there aren't sort of these um, analogous KPIs for prediction markets. And it seems like a lot of the way that you're looking at um, the political betting and, um, you know, these other areas that you branched out into is through sort of the, the betting lens. I was wondering, how do you think about um, sort of using these markets as a source of information? Um, and, you know, do you think about, you know, sort of what ways you can um, sort of affect markets to make them more accurate for, for information gathering um, or for using these markets to hedge on bigger plays? Like, how do you think about the uses of these markets, at least in the political space? Yeah, I mean, to me, that's the dream. That's the dream is to make these markets useful. Like, it, it's not to, like, help people, you know, have a $10 punt on, you know, <laughs> Trump getting reelected or not, it's really to give, you know, my dream would be the market is a reference point so that, you know, when New York Times is right. talking about, you know, is Trump going to run or not, they're quoting our markets to inform the user and not just using mm -hmm. some, some random poll or something. So I would like, that's, that, that's one of the main visions I have for the company. And if we get to that point, I'll feel like we were a huge success. In terms of uh, getting to that point, the political markets suffer from two main things. One, that they're very infrequent, and two, they're not repeatable. And people don't like to bet on stuff that is infrequent, and they don't like to bet on stuff that's not repeatable. So a good example is, you know, sports betting is massive, uh, but betting on the Olympics is 
like minuscule, like it's almost comically small how much, how, how little people bet in the Olympics. And it's because nobody knows what a sprinting match should look like. Nobody know, you know, but besides Usain Bolt, nobody knows who's running. Nobody knows like how much faster everybody's in everybody, you know, for the most part of the world, you watch a hundred meter dash once every four years. And, but everybody in the world, you know, I'm using soccer because I'm, you know, more European focused, but everybody knows an NFL game. Everybody knows a soccer game. Everybody has an opinion about Tom Brady and Messi, and, you know, and so people don't want to trade stuff they don't understand. And so even though, you know, everybody knows about an election and probably has an opinion, people are not used to that kind of mechanism to put money behind a non-sports opinion. And then the other part of it not being repeatable is that you don't really get comfortable with the dynamics of it. And so, you know, in some cases, your money can get tied up for years. And in other cases, you're just too uncertain about you know, the thing about betting on Sunday, you know, like, let's say you're betting on Sunday, every Sunday for the NFL, you get kind of used to it. You know, you, you get a feel for the risk, you get a feel mm. for the payouts, you get a feel for, you know, how do I make money and lose money? But it's, there's no equivalent to that in, in political betting. So the main thing that's stopping political betting, I think, uh, going mainstream in terms of like an information source is you need a critical mass of, a, you know, you need that diverse group of betters. <laughs> Uh, that are trading it so that you actually trust uh, where things are traded. Most political markets are incredibly thin. Um, and even, you know, as a big believer in the science behind it, I wouldn't put too much stock in where a lot of our markets trade because they're very thinly traded right now. Um, so that's probably the big thing. And then I would say the secondary thing, which is a passion of mine, like the interfaces aren't there yet for the public to uh, to make it accessible. So if you go on smartkids.com, like, I think we probably have one of the best um, user interfaces for this, but I, our interface is still too sports betting heavy and esoteric. If, you, if you're like a BBC reader and you just want to know what the price of Macron getting reelected, I think you still find our site quite confusing. So I think there's a lot of challenges to getting to that point where political betting is, um, is a news source, but, uh, but that's, uh, that's, uh, I dream about that. I think it would be very helpful for society. I think uh, our our dreams align, you know, a Andrew and I like to view, it'd be great if when a piece of news happened, people first look at prediction markets and say, oh, actually, the the New York Times is saying this is an absolute game changer, but Smarkets or Callshi or Polymarket, look, they're pretty flat. Maybe the world isn't actually falling apart today. And then, yeah. you know, actually when big signals come out, then you can find them through the markets. Um, Jason, as sort of the final question, um, and, you know, we've talked about sort of UI and where do you like to see that go is um, like, how do you see markets evolving over the rest of 2021 and into 2022? Are there uh, major projects or areas that you want to go into or is you working on like refinement right now? Um, just what can people expect from the platform? Yeah, from a from a business point of view, our main focus is on recreational sports betting. So we're basically trying to take our uh, you know, our pricing model, which is basically the best odds in the world in sports betting and, and popularize that sports betting is blowing up in the United States, uh, which, which I'm sure everybody's aware of FanDuel and DraftKings, but they offer really, really horrible pricing model, bad user interfaces. And so our main thrust as a business is to try to be competitive in that space with our technology approach. In terms of political betting, we just hired a great guy, Matthew Shattuck from Ladbrokes, who's really spearheading our efforts into making our markets richer, um, more responsive, and having better liquidity. So it's something we're continuing to invest in. At some point, we're going to switch our markets interface to being a prediction market first interface and a sports betting uh, interface second. Um, so like at some point, we're going to switch. I don't know when we're going to make that switch, but, uh, but that's definitely in the cards. Um, it just reminded me, I think it's worth uh, probably spending a few minutes talking about this word prediction market. I like it because everybody kind of gets instantly what, what you mean when you say prediction market. But I think it's for the industry, I think it's a horrible, horrible term because people get hung up on this word prediction. And everybody thinks, and unless you're from the biz, everybody thinks if it's trading at 
you know, it's like a hundred percent chance of yes. If it's training at 49%, it's hundred percent chance of no. And then if the opposite happens, they're like, oh, the prediction market got it wrong. You know, it's like, it's like, you know, if it says it's a 60% chance to rain tomorrow and it's sunny, you don't say stupid forecast. It's I'm so never wrong. Looking. Yeah, exactly. It's so wrong. So I think for the industry and maybe you guys as a, as a, you know, a fresh voice in the industry can help think of a, a better word for it. But I do think a prediction market is a really bad word. Um, the best, the be- term, the best kind of term I've come up with is like a vent market or betting market, I think is a mm-hmm. more realistic, uh, you know, effective term, but, but it's something I've calls themselves with. future event contract trading is I think their terminology they came out with, although that I think also swings a little too esoteric in terms of its construction. Um, yeah, I think future is too heavy of a word. It's yeah. too, and it's, it's got a financial meaning that unless you're from finance, you don't understand forecasting then, markets, uh, right? Cause that, that then goes into like the weather forecasts rather than yeah. prediction, right? Cause like, I, I guess the, the, the fear with prediction is it's kind of like the, like the crystal ball uh, view of it rather which than, which it's not, it's not a it's crystal not. ball. No, it's a it shouldn't guess. Be. It's yeah. a, it's a guess on the future. It's like when people say, Oh, well, Nate Silver's model was wrong. It's like, well, they gave it a 71.4% chance. That's like, yeah. if you had two children that were born the same sex, right? Like that's, that, that happens all the time. No one says your forecast was entirely wrong in terms of, you know, you're going to have one boy or one girl or something like that. Right. But, and one, and one of the, um, one of the un, unspoken truths is humans have a really bad intuition of probability. So to give you, to put it into perspective, if you take something at a 20% chance and a 30% chance, most people will think it's about the same, but you know, and it's a, there's a massive difference between a 20% chance and 30% chance. So like part of the reason this is such a hard concept to talk to people is that most people are not, you know, humans do not have a natural intuition of probability and trying to explain probability to a layman audience is, is a very difficult, uh, it's a very difficult endeavor. So that's also a how challenge. How do you see that, industry. you know, cha- just real quick, I, we're a little bit going over, but like, how, how do you see, yeah. you know, a potential solution from like a, a UI UX perspective in terms of when someone new signs up, how, how you get across these um, concepts or is it just like the best way to learn is through you know trial and practice when you realize your 30 percent and your 20 percent actually work out very differently yeah I think it's it's about um, I think the best path into the to this world is sort of if you think about uh, polls people feel comfortable with polls even if they don't understand standard deviations and stuff like that but people feel comfortable with polls so I think you sort of come at it with like the percent chance of X according to this is, is, uh, and I think people can get comfortable with that, uh, is, is sort of the, the gateway into this, into this industry. And I think getting them to trade is a secondary consideration. I think the first consideration is to get people to be, uh, passive consumers of these, uh, of the prices. Well, maybe it's prediction polls is the name. I think that's what Pavel Atanasov determined things like good judgment, or metaculous. I I know we still have the prediction thing, so maybe it's forecasting mm. polls. Um, but you would never call, uh, you know, if you take a poll for the uh, say twenty. Oh my God! When's the next presidential election? Twenty twenty four. Twenty twenty four. Yeah, you would never say a prediction poll for twenty twenty four, would you? You just say the poll for twenty twenty four. A forecasted right? poll. You would never say know. forecast no. though. Might just have to be something that comes with time. I don't think. You just well, think if may, maybe our listeners have some ideas, or this will definitely be something that Andrew would definitely have to return to because you you raise a lot of great points, Jason. Did not. Yeah. Yeah, because we think about we, betting we market. I like, market. Yeah, I like betting Especially market. Now, everybody, you know, betting is a loaded word because you kind it's of associated with gambling accurate. too. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, but that's what you're doing. It's a bet. Yeah. <laughs> And it doesn't have that word prediction or future. You know, it doesn't have that kind of weight on it. You know, if the betting market says the Patriots are going to win and the Patriots lose, people don't say the betting market is stupid. Sounds more high for you know. So I think there's something to betting market. Truly, everybody's just betting on events. Yeah, I'm not a better. I'm a forecaster. (laughs) Well, technically, I'm a future trader. (laughs) Future, I trade the future. I like, wait, so future. you trade futures on no, 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 different kind. <laughs> um, 
<laughs> um, Jason Tross, thank you so much for joining us on the Crowd Money Cast. Where uh, can our listeners find you and Smarkets? On Twitter, uh, at Smarkets and at Jason Tross, you can find me. And uh, yeah, that's probably the best place to start. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for joining us on the show. Thanks for having me, guys. So, Andrew, I thought that was a pretty interesting conversation with Jason. And I think his little homework assignment about finding a new name for prediction markets uh, is is interesting. Uh, what do you think about the task and what do you think constitutes uh, the benchmark for a better name than prediction markets? Yeah, I, mean, I think the task is really important. Um, you know, I'm sure there's a lot of this sort of work being done in um, the crypto space, for example, as it was taking off, trying to create syntax that, you know, was was accurate um, and, you know, sort of explain the concepts relevant to the technology, but at the same time, um, you know, was understandable, uh, comprehensible by sort of laymen um, so that they didn't feel, uh, you know, that there were these intellectual hurdles to, you know, join the community. Um, I think, you know, we were tossing around with uh, Jason, the idea of betting markets or forecasting markets, I think, um, you know, part of the reason why, you know, I'll call them prediction markets right now, but one of the reasons why they were, um, you know, sort of knocked down when, uh, you know, when they were being explored within the US government back in the 80s was this idea that, you know, betting on politics was somehow, um, you know, morally uh, questionable. And so I think, you know, well, betting works for a lot of the sports markets. Um, you know, maybe it doesn't sound as good when we're talking about politics and elections and uh, conflict and stuff like that. And so, uh, you know, I think finding the right terminology is going to be really important um, just for further adoption and also just so we can uh, communicate clearly when we're talking about these platforms. Um, yeah, I don't know if you have any thoughts, you know, about specific names. Um, if you like any of the ones that we tossed around already, um, yeah, curious as to your thoughts. I mean, I'm not a huge fan of the ones that we just came up with because we came up with them off the cuff. So they're probably, you know, not the best because someone else probably thought of that and pitched it around and it hasn't caught on yet. Um, I do think, though, it raises a an interesting point is, you know, this idea of prediction. And Jason was saying that, you know, there's this thought that prediction is like, guessing the future and like the if you say 55 percent, that means it's going to happen and if it didn't that you're completely wrong is will that be an issue w when prediction markets become big enough right like does necessarily that word have to change um it it may not you know i don't think there's anything on the face you know of it wrong with the word prediction um, I think, you know, there's a firm I was talking to recently, actually, that does something called GP stakes investing, and they um, basically invest in um, asset management firms that take a stake of, of their equity, and then they get returns, um, you know, based on the performance of the firms. I think one phrase that might be interesting um, that might come up in this space is event staking, so taking stakes and mm. events. Um, and events, you know, can range sports, politics, um, you know, sort of whatever the runs the gamut of topics. But I think event staking is a somewhat uh, agnostic term that, you know, I think is somewhat accurate to, to the work being done on these platforms. So, I mean, that's one thought. And um, Event trading, you know, maybe because I feel like staking is a little, I mean, that introduces a new word that probably isn't in most people's vocabulary. Although I think talking about the crypto market right that definitely will be there but i like the word trading i feel like at least right now it seems like people for the most part buy a position hold you know if maybe they'll add to it but it doesn't seem like there's much um as much activity as i would expect with the idea of trading i feel like trading mm -hmm. is very like high volume um quant driven uh you know high high liquidity activity but i think Something in that realm, you know, um, event trading, event staking, something like that is probably a bit more accurate. Um, but then you also don't want to lose this idea of markets, right? Like, I think the fact these are markets, um, you know, and 
are affected by, you know, market gear is also relevant. Well, listeners, if you guys have your own thoughts in terms of what should be the replacement of prediction markets, put it in the comment section down below. And if it, if it ends up becoming the one, we will give you at least 50% credit or at least 40. You know, maybe we want to keep the majority. Who knows? <laughs> um, and with that, we will see you guys in just about two weeks for the third episode of the Crowd Money newsletter, which will come out at crowdmoney.io on October the 26th. So you can go ahead and subscribe for free over there. And it'll come straight into your inbox. And then the third episode of the Crowd Money cast coming with an interview with the founder and CEO of Hedgehog Markets in mid-November. Thank you, everyone, for listening. I'm sorry about my cold, and we will see you shortly. Thanks and bye-bye.